This is the face of eternal happiness. ta -da! This is the face caused up this game. Whose title you can see down below. The infamous or famous Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness. So, yeah. Check out my plant, by the way. Isn't it cool? Hmm? Can you see it? It's over there. Check out. And this is IKEA shelf riddled with Christmas LED lamps. Just because I couldn't be bothered to turn them off for the last three years. But I guess this makes up for the atmosphere. The atmosphere of joy and internal happiness that is caused by this game. Oh yes. So, enough of that chit chat bullshit. And let's go down to the topic to see what's what. Okay? Let's go. So, The Angel of Darkness was one big colossal flop. By many, it was considered to be the shittiest Tomb Raider game in the world. But why? What happened? What could have possibly gone so much wrong that one game single-handedly rendered its maker gone and nearly killed the entire franchise? In fact, there are a multitude of reasons that people are mentioning as crucial when answering those questions. On the surface, they might be right. And I say might because I think they're all wrong. In fact, I know they're all wrong. Everything you all know is wrong about this game. I'm gonna prove it to you. So, I was one of those young people from back in the day that couldn't be bothered to even play the Angel of Darkness. Everybody and their parents were doing some heavy doses of verbal and maybe literal defecation towards the game. The official and not so official critics universally panned it so there was no reason for me to even try it. Fast forward 20 years and here I am, buying this game on Steam for less than 1 euro. Oh well, at least it's cheap. It's time to confront this tragic game at once and reach the verdict. Unfortunately, immediately after downloading the game, Build 52, I'm confronted with an error. This one. Typical gamer would be probably very aggravated by this state of affairs, but not a real gamer because this game is actually testing your resourcefulness or something. You know, going online searching for a solution. It's like in game you are doing some dungeon and searching for a lever to open the door. This is the same deal. You are searching for a solution, you find it, you tick some checkboxes, and that's it. The game starts. Easy money. Easy money. Repeat after me. Easy money. Easy money. Easy money. Easy money. So, main menu... What can be said about it? Well, it looks very stylish, at least for the year 2003. As you can see, the logo is different. This time it's resembling the subpar cash grab excuse of a movie that I gladly forgot. But the Angel of Darkness logo is an embodiment of a vastly superior experience. Ok, enough about the logo and the menu. They serve their purpose and that's it. Shall we play the game? Ok, let's dive in. That's right, the aspect of the story is so much better than any Tomb Raider preceding the Angel of Darkness. Seriously now, it feels like Core Design actually spent some significant time shaping the story, which is cool. Finally you have some solid leads, solid motives and solid plot devices to actually carry on with the gameplay. Story continues after the events of the last revelation slash chronicles, so you know who is going to be there. You know we need to tie up some loose ends. You also know that in Tomb Raider Chronicles, our favorite dirty old bastard Von Croy shouted this. We found her. Obviously experiencing sudden dementia, mistaking Lara Croft for a backpack. This time, these two will meet again. She was actually summoned by Wong Croy to come to Paris to help him find the whereabouts of the five Obscura paintings. He was employed by our main psychopath antagonist Eckhart, Eckhart, Eckhart to find such paintings, but he was also in a constant fear for his life. There was a supposed serial killer roaming around going by the moniker Monstrum, killing some people in the process, and Wong Croy might be the next target. After an argument in which was evident that Lara Croft still holds that Egypt mishap against him as seen on this part of the footage. The argument was soon interrupted by a sudden gunshot, killing poor Wong Croy and rendering Lara the prime suspect in the process. After all, she was the only one with him at the time of the killing. 
Now this becomes very intriguing because now you have unsolved murder. You actually have some obscure paintings to be found and you need to run away from the French cops in order to save yourself. I just love the description of a suspect. Female, described as a Caucasian, brunette, wearing a ponytail. I mean, it's so vague. Good luck finding that kind of a woman, you morons. Anyways, that killing might be the, the work of Monstrum. But who is Monstrum actually? Who is Eckhart? So many questions, so many plot devices, I just need to play the game. Because the game is cool. In short, these five obscure paintings contain a piece of Sanglyph. If you assemble all of the five pieces, you can use it to do all sorts of crazy stuff like manipulate energy or clone yourself multiple times. Eckhart, 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 wants to use it to awaken the sleeper, which is supposed to be the last Nephilim, so he can restore the Nephilim race. Nephilim are a mixed race that originated from humans and angels. Yes, you can see where this is going. You know you need to have one big lunatic or an antagonist who wants to play the god. It's like having Natla or Dr. Willard all over again. It's like I'm playing some sort of ancient aliens game. I mean, this one should not come as a surprise. With the arrival of the 6th generation of the consoles, PS2, first Xbox and GameCube, the significant jump in the visual department was to be expected. I mean, check out how it looks and compare it with any of the first 5 Tomb Raider games. The difference is like night and day. Suddenly these classic games look so old they'll make your eyes bleed in vain. No wonder they need remasters. The Angel of Darkness actually looks exactly as the title suggests. I mean this part darkness to be more exact. Everything looks so grittier, darker, serious, sinister, gloomier. I'm running out of adjectives right now. Oh, I know one more. It looks very... Uh, European-ish? Well, it's not a proper word. I know, it looks gothic. Visuals remind me of a lot of games of the era that were suffering from a condition called Eurojank. You know, all of these glitchy Eastern European games and stuff. But who cares, because finally, the game looks gorgeous. It reminds me of another rather unpopular game released in the same era. Do you remember a game called Primal? A game from the developers of Medieval and C12? It features a young female protagonist with the capabilities to turn into a demon. It was a cool concept, but a universally panned game for being... I don't know what... Mediocre? I think it had some potential, can't really remember anymore though. Also, the parts of the Angel of Darkness remind me of the original Deus Ex or even Invisible War. I mean, all of the games were released by Eidos, so maybe some of the assets were shared amongst the dev teams. And here I am talking rubbish all day about all of the visuals, when the simple conclusion is this. The visuals are great. The visuals, even from today's standpoint, they, they are pretty good. I mean, I was playing the game recently, just right now, and it's actually very well made. Sure, you can see some objects that are blurry or something like that. Some unimportant objects. But it doesn't matter, who cares? Everything that matters. You know, human physique, important objects and items and everything. It all looks rather sharp and rather well. And if you ask me, that's all that matters. I mean, what more do you want? Except for the Lancia Delta Integrale. It looks like crap. Look at the same car in Gran Turismo 3. I guess we can't have everything now, can we? Holy fucking shit in the actual fuck of the biggest fuckery of the fucked up fuck. They actually dare to change the gameplay section? They actually dare to change Lara's controls and overall moveset? Oh my fucking god. Oh yes. After five years of grid-like tank controls, here comes... Uh, how to say it? Here comes the semi-upgraded take on a tank control. Gun is the uniform movement and gun is the environment laid out of squares. This time Lara moves more freely in a way that movement is uneven. Her legs adapt the ledges and stairs. She automatically grabs pipes and ladders to climb onto them and so on. However, the biggest change this time is the combat. Holding weapons puts Lara in, let's say, attack mode while she will automatically target the enemy. But this time, you can freely run and shoot in the desired directions while running. You can also switch targets with a button click, so this is also improved if you want to kill the enemy who is closer to you. So finally, the combat is improved. And also check this out, 
you can actually use your arms and legs to kick the enemies. Yep, Lara can do some primitive karate which is a nice touch but it's kinda sloppy. And having plenty of ammo and weapons scattered throughout the game, it's really not necessary to perform the King of Iron Fist event on the poor guards. You know this wouldn't be it without some stealth action now, would it? Would it? Would it? Hmm? What do you think? You know that the year is 2003 and everybody and their mother is putting stealth on everything, so you know Tomb Raider needs to do it as well. So we are doing some leaning on the walls just like on the MGS and we are approaching the guards from behind in the stealth movement so we can neutralize them. I mean, it's it looks all cool on paper, but in reality, just like I said before, if you have guns and plenty of ammo, why bother? Just shoot them. I mean, there is no punishment for that. The game is not punishing you. I mean, it's much easier to shoot them. But what can you do? Shoot them. Have you noticed this orange depleting meter when Lara is doing shimmy movements, doing monkey bar moves or when she's performing the hanging on the wires? That's right, you can't do those moves for eternity, but it all comes in hand with another cool feature presented for the first time in the franchise. At the beginning of the game, Lara is at her weakest, so to speak. Sometimes she won't be able to shimmy across the entire section or she won't be able to open the door because she is not strong enough. But if she performs certain stuff like pulling some blocks, or if she kicks a door like so, or if she kicks this metal bridge like this in this instance, she will say this. I feel stronger now. And then she can open that aforementioned door or shimmy across for a longer period of time. This is not some light RPG stats increasing experience, but it's a nice bit of a distraction. Even though I don't know how strong she can possibly become. I don't know if I can see any stats in the game. Imprecise and inconsistent moves, like running, like falling off and jumping, probably pissed off many players because you would think that, you know, pressing the button would do something, Lara would jump and sometimes it feels like she doesn't register that, she doesn't jump, so you fall off and die. And yeah, I agree to a certain degree. I was doing the same thing with my trusty Xbox One controller and I was thinking like, is something wrong with this? I mean, it's an Xbox One controller. But sometimes she wouldn't jump. Sometimes Lara would fall off a cliff. And I was like, hmm, why is that happening? And suddenly it dawned upon me that actually this is intentional. It's, it's like a real life, you know? Sometimes you would run faster. Sometimes you would not feel like running. You would run, run slower. Sometimes you would jump higher, sometimes you would not. I mean, the game is like that. I mean, it's like real life. And that's perfect, because what's more realistic than that? I mean, sometimes you do not feel like running. You don't. Sometimes you don't feel like jumping. You don't jump. Just like in the game. She doesn't run. She doesn't feel like it. Who gives a fuck if I want to run? She doesn't. Who cares? Next time she'll run. And you need to deal with that. I mean... What can you do? That's perfect. That's life. That's realistic. What more do we want? Unrealistic game? Go play something else like Uncharted. I don't know. Nah, I'm just talking rabbits. The Angel of Darkness is, unlike some of the past games, set mostly in Europe. As you can probably see already, this is an urbane oriented game as you roam in the ghetto parts of the Paris or Central Square in Prague, ravage some apartments and even dwell in the sewers. Everything that resembles the true Tomb Raider. For the first time ever, you will encounter NPCs that you can actually talk to, like this blonde named Janice or a bartender named Pierre. As you can see, sometimes the game offers you the ability to choose the part of the dialogue to steer the conversation in a certain direction. But as far as I see, this was just a wishful thinking because I haven't seen any different outcomes even if I tried to do the conversation in different ways. The game is pretty much linear and that's it. These NPCs will either give you clues about what to do or where to go or give you some tasks in exchange for some information. This whole Parisian ghetto with its sub-level parts acts like a hub of some sort. It reminds me much of original Deus Ex and Hell's Kitchen. Don't know why. Probably because of the visuals. And that's the only level that will be like this. Every other level in the game is going from point A to point B. Even though I like doing stupid shit, 
like in this museum of Louvre, the famous one, and betting on a boxing match in the church in the Parisian ghetto, or searching for stuff in Vasily's apartment and, and uh, going through the sanitarium. It's all cool, but it's not Tomb Raider. I mean, I'm not raiding tombs. This is all urban environment. And so if you ask me, the best level, the best couple of levels are set underneath the Louvre. Louvre. I don't know if I pronounce it right. Louvre. That's right, going into the archaeological dig to solve this cool but relatively simple lock mechanism is just the beginning of something that we've been waiting for. Oh yes, this is tomb braiding right there. Descending full platformer style in the tomb of the ancients to reach the best level in the game is very cool. What's the best level? Well, let me present to you the Hall of Seasons. Oh yeah. First of all, I lied. Yes, I admit. This one also serves as a mini hub level, not just Parisian ghetto, in which you press the golden buttons in the middle of the level to open the doors. These doors will put you through many trials and tribulations with obstacles and stuff. And that's so Tomb Raider it's not even funny. I love it. If only this game had more of the levels like this one, it'd be cool. I mean, don't get me wrong, Strahov section with bio research facility, maximum containment area or aquatic research area is surprisingly well executed with the level layouts and all that, but the whole of seasons wins my heart, what can I say? Hmm, what is there to say? Like we established earlier, the controls are different so they are taking some time to get used to, which is great since we got bored doing the same thing for 5 times in a row, right? 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 Oh ok, never mind the controls right now. What about the enemies and stuff? Well, the Angel of Darkness surprisingly doesn't have that many enemies. I was kinda expecting this game to be very much infested with human enemies like Tomb Raider 2, but it isn't. But the dominant type of enemies, yep, humans. There's really no point in doing any stealth nonsense because shooting them is much easier. Plus you get plenty of ammo, so go waste the ammo on the bastards. Other than that, you'll encounter some wild dogs, bats, rats, undead skeletons and stuff, but they are so thinly dispersed that you would forget their existence. I believe that this game has only 4 bosses. Only 4 in 29 levels. That's not a lot, plus they are easy to figure out and kill, except this flying bastard that is guarding one of the obscura paintings. This fight itself is not necessarily hard, but it's very cryptic by design. It's hard to notice when the bastard is stunned so you can snatch a painting and he's stunned for like 2 seconds. Not cool. Oh, I totally forgot that I should be convincing you that this game is great, that this game is awesome, that you should absolutely play it. And you should, because it's great. And for one additional reason. For the first time. Ever. I mean, not ever. Up until 2003, for the first time, you can play as another character, not Lara. Another protagonist needs our help, needs our control, needs our attention. Oh yes. After the brief sexual tension right here. Ok, that was anything but brief. This time we get to play as Curtis Trent. He has his own reasons for looking for a card. And I guess it would be wise to join Lara. Except he cannot sprint. What a waste of time. But he has this ability called Far C, where he can scan the surroundings using telekinesis and shit. This comes in handy when searching for clues such as passwords. Unfortunately, he's playable in only 3 levels, which is a shame because he's cool. Look at that coolness. Almost as cool as this scene. Almost. Sword. <laughs> Time to go to work, guys. Inventory is also different this time, and items are categorized in health, weapons, and items section. Yep, you can even eat chocolate candy bars to replenish your health for a bit. Naturally, the bigger the health pack is, the more health you get. 
the selection of weapons range between basic small and inefficient pistol ones like MV9, Vector R35 or RIG-09 and big precise and deadly ones like Viper SMG or Mag Vega. The game is very generous with ammo drops so you'll probably use a lot of these to eliminate resistance. Which is totally the proper way to play the game, right? I find it fascinating that somebody would drop this just like that, for nobody to steal them? I'm rich! Yep, you can find some valuable items like rings to exchange them for money in the pawn shop. At least in Paris. I don't know where else to pawn the items, it's a obviously kills the poor guy. What a damn shame, that bastard. So this is the part that was long overdue now, isn't it? If everything I've said up until this point was... On point, legit, right... Then, what caused this game to be so universally abandoned and hated by many gamers for many years to come? Oh boy, where do we even start? Ok, first of all, the Angel of Darkness had the most troubled development cycle of any Tomb Raider game back then. Part of the team was already working on the next gen Lara Croft games, as the other part of the team was working on Chronicles to get some extra cash. So that was one problem right there. For less than a year, the team was essentially split into two, so they could develop two games simultaneously. Next problem is obvious struggles with using the new technology for the next generation. Lots of the tools already built ain't gonna cut it no more, so the Angel of Darkness was probably written and designed from the ground up which takes time. I'm not really sure, but I believe the platform of choice was probably the PlayStation 2 console over the PC platform. And we all know that the 128-bit emotion engine coupled with the dedicated graphic synthesizer was a tough beast to conquer, to actually fully understand it of course. And for the first time ever, Core Design spent 3 years developing the game. Remember, all of the other Tomb Raider games were released on a yearly basis. How do you tell your publisher that you need triple the amount of time to develop a game? Well, let's carry on to the next point. Next and probably the biggest problem was ambition. It feels like core design, maybe even under slight pressure by Eidos too, wanted to go all out with Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness. First of all, the game is supposed to be more mature, more serious. You know, characters dealing with realistic, relatable problems and so on. Then, there were these RPG wannabe elements that were maybe supposed to be more complex and detailed, but they ended up being so laughable and mundane. Then, there is the case of another character, Curtis Trent, who was supposed to be controlled differently. He should actually have a sword, but he ended up being like a male version of Lara. Some of the levels and dialogues were heavily cut also to meet the deadline. Hell, Core Design even planned to have a trilogy with one game using only Curtis as a playable character. But that was immediately scrapped, which brings me on to the last problem. And that's the premature release of a semi-finished game. Sure, the game was delayed multiple times and Eidos was not having it anymore. So what did they do? They pressured Core Design to finish the game around the time that shitty movie was about to be released. But as we all know from the experience, delayed but ironed out game will fare much better with the public than a rushed buggy mess that would forever be crucified by pissed off gamers. And as a final result, the entire supposed trilogy was heavily cut and chosen parts were pasted and merged together into one mess called the Angel of Darkness. Even though the game sold in decent numbers, more than 2 millions of copies, plus one of my 20 years later, that didn't help at all. The game was hyped as the next big thing so much by Eidos, like it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. So no wonder everybody was pissed. Of course, after the fiasco, there was a universal need for a scapegoat. You know, you need to place the blame on somebody. Unfortunately, that somebody was poor core design as Eidos probably steered all the blame towards them, rendering them incapable of making a proper Tomb Raider game. So they shifted the further development of the future Tomb Raider games to Crystal Dynamics and that was the final closure of an era. Some of the core members of core design chose to leave and the remnants of the dev team rebranded themselves as Rebellion which was a short-lived episode. Such a shame. One day you are on the top of the world and the next day you no longer exist. How the mighty have fallen. Well, my simple conclusion is this. Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness is not that bad. That's it. Wrap this up. Oh, what's that? You want more complicated explanation about that? Okay, here we go. Sure, you can really experience lots of moments where you feel like you're playing the alpha version of the game. 
many bugs, stupid ineffective controls, obvious cut content and sometimes uneven distribution of story elements can steer away anybody who wants excellence. To add insult to injury, the game even crashes in one level, so I needed to search for the fix to be able to finish it. But, when you get used to it, and I kinda got used to it rather quickly, the Angel of Darkness starts to slightly grow on you more and more as you play it. Soundtrack is really great, maybe the best part of the game. The gothic, serious tone was a welcome change, and the story itself is interesting enough to keep you motivated to play. I can recognize the overall ambition of developing the game was there, but there just wasn't enough time to complete it, and that's a shame. If I was to play the game back then, I'd probably be pissed as everybody was, and I would never touch it again. These days, I'm more forgiving towards the rushed alpha releases since there were numerous examples of the games released too early in the garbage state only to be polished for the years to come. If there was the chance for redemption 20 years ago, maybe Core Design would polish the game by the year 2004 or so, and they would still be around even today. We'll never know. So the final question remains, should you play the Angel of Darkness or not? Well, it depends. If you're a long time fan of Tomb Raider and you actually skip this one, or if I manage to convince you throughout this video, then give it a try. Maybe you'll like it, who knows. Maybe you'll be positively surprised despite the shortcomings. But for all the other people, well, it's still very unfinished, buggy mess most of the time, unfortunately. So I don't know. I completely wasted your time probably because there is no definitive answer to the question. Thanks so much for watching and I hope my face didn't disturb you so you won't sleep the next seven days or something. And until next time, take care.